as we return back to our seats and open our Bibles today to go into our time to hear and respond to a message from God's Word, I invite you to open up to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, to where our call of worship came from this morning, verses 12 through 19. This is where we'll be heading today. And as you are turning there this morning to this most wonderful moment, this most wonderful moment of history where Jesus enters into Jerusalem triumphantly. Because boy, it was triumphant. But it wasn't triumphant because of the crowds. It wasn't triumphant because of all the shouts. It wasn't triumphant because of the palm branches and all the waving. It was triumphant for a whole other reason. It was triumphant for what it would lead to. Because Jesus, unlike the crowds there, as we were going to talk about here in a second, Jesus knew exactly what he was walking into. And thanks be to God for that. Because he willingly did it. But I ask for, for us all to put ourselves there in that moment. Grab a palm branch. Join the shouts and praises. Ask yourself, what do you hear? What do you see? What is it you even smell? Put yourself in the crowd. Put yourself amongst the disciples. It doesn't matter where you put yourself, but put yourself there this morning. If you have to, as I read this, close your eyes and, and think about it. But one of the most important questions I want us to ask ourselves is, what is it you do? More importantly, what is it you expect? Let us go there right now to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 12 through 19. It says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that? You're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. And those crowds shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, Jesus. Save us. What did you see? What did you hear? What did you feel? What was your expectation in this moment? What do you think would come next? Now, we know what comes next. We celebrate what comes next each and every year. But take a moment to forget that. Remove it from your mind. Put yourself in the shoes of a first century Jew in Jerusalem. What do you expect to happen next? More importantly, what are you doing? I know inside and out, I'm dancing like a little child. I'm excited. The king has come. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of David. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. I heard about Lazarus. I heard that Jesus raised him from the dead. This Jesus raises people from the dead. Can you believe it? We can go talk to Lazarus right now. He's down the street here to celebrate for the festival. And the same person that raised him from the dead is coming right now. It had been so easy to get caught up in that fanfare. It had been so easy to get caught up in the expectation of what the Jews expected Jesus to come to do. And that was to save them. 
not save them how we understand salvation, as we know the whole story. We know that Jesus is coming to be crucified. He is coming to be unjustly turned over and arrested to, by the authorities, unjustly hung upon the cross, for Pilate will say himself, I see no fault in this man. He is innocent. Time and time again, there is no fault in him. But nevertheless, the crowd, the same crowd that's shouting, Hosanna, save us right now, is the same crowd that's going to shout, crucify him five days later. Because they didn't understand what their cry and plea was truly for. They didn't understand why it is Jesus had come. They had the right word, Hosanna. Now, that's an interesting word. It's really not an English word, even though it is in our English dictionaries, Hosanna. You can look it up in Merriam-Webster, and you will find that there's an actual def definition. It's a cry of acclamation and ador adoration, which isn't this what it is? That's what the people are doing. They're adoring Jesus. They are worshiping and praising Jesus. But there's more to this word than this 12th century definition, which is the first use of this word in English we have, Hosanna, the 12th century. In fact, the origin of this word goes further back, all the way to Hebrew. And it's not just one Hebrew word, it is two Hebrew words. Two Hebrew words that's found in Psalm 118, 25, which says, Save us, we pray, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, we pray, give us success. Now, we need to understand something about this psalm, in particular the tone of the poetry here, the tone that this verse is. It is a plea for help. It is a plea for help knowing good and well who can help but God alone. Because, as it will say earlier in this text, his steadfast love endures forever. And this is a plea, knowing that God responds to those who plead to him for help. And God does. He doesn't just hear our pleas. He responds and is active in responding in our pleas. This is a plea of desperation. Save us, we pray. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, we pray. This is a fervent prayer given by the, the psalmist. And we know exactly who it is that they are praying to, who they are pleading to because of how the word Lord is spelled. If we can get that verse back up there real quick, do you notice anything different about it? Psalm 118.25. Might be having, we've been having a lot of technical difficulties today. So if you would look at it in your Bible, do you notice the difference in the word Lord compared to all the other words? It's all caps. It's all caps. And it's not trying to emphasize the word. It's because of what this word Lord actually is. It is the covenant name of God. In the, in the actual Hebrew text, what we have here is what is the covenant name given to Moses on the mountain of God and how we translate it into English because we don't actually know how to translate God's name because the Hebrews intentionally, when they wrote the scriptures, misspelled the name every time. And they, they, they did this on purpose so that we would never misuse God's covenant name. And so what we have here is in English what we do whenever it's using the word, the, that covenant name, we can identify it. We, we translate it in all caps. So they're literally, literally saying, save us, we pray, O oh Lord God, by name. They are calling out to God by name. By name we pray, Lord, save us, Jesus. Jesus, we pray, save us. All the more reason to show us this is a plea of desperation. And the first two Hebrew words here, the first one is yasha, which means deliver and to save. The second, ana, which means to beg and beseech. 
to beg and beseech. You put the two together, and what do you get? Hosanna. Yasana. The exact words the people cry out to Jesus. Save us, we pray, we beg, save us. And we know this is exactly what they're saying because of verse 26 of Psalm 118. If we go to verse 26, what we see is, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. We put them together, and what we see is, Save us, we pray, O Lord, O Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Sounds a lot like what we saw in verse 13. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, save us, please help us, he who comes in the name of the Lord. The people shout appropriately to Jesus. They they sing out joyously to Jesus these psalms that they knew from childhood, these songs and these psalms that they would sing in synagogue, these psalms that they would go to the temple recalling that God would send his Messiah. God would send his Savior. But the truth of the matter is, he wasn't anything like they expected. They expected a conquering king, especially as Jesus rode in on a donkey. You say, that doesn't sound very conquering. But if we go to Zechariah 9.9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. All the more showing the people that Jesus is coming as the Messiah. And they rightly recognize him through these Old Testament prophets that he is the Messiah and he is going to save them. But they're expecting a salvation in a temporary problem that they were having. Jesus was coming to bring them, to bring us salvation for an eternal problem that we have. They can only see the here and now. Jesus was dealing with the bigger picture. Jesus was dealing with what was beyond the horizon. Yet all they could see was the here and now. And I'm sure the disciples, that's all they saw too. Because Jesus would tell the disciples time and time again. In fact, he would prophesy three times about his own death. He would tell the disciples time and time and time again, you know, the Son of Man must be delivered and handed over to the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes, and he will be condemned and condemned and sentenced to death. He actually says these words time and time again. But for some reason, they just didn't quite get it. In fact, in verse 16, it tells us just this. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these had been written about him. These things had been written about him and had been done to him. They weren't connecting all the dots yet. Jesus was still what they wanted Jesus to be in their minds, not who Jesus came to be. Jesus was still coming to do the things that they wanted Jesus to do, not the things that he actually came to do. And the things that Jesus came to do compared to the things we wanted him to do were far more greater, far more significant than anything we could have ever imagined. Because once again, those people, that crowd that day, shouting Hosanna, shouting save us, appropriately saying, Lord Jesus, save us. Because they knew he was their savior. But they wanted salvation from a temporary problem. They weren't even concerned about the eternal matter that Jesus came to save them from. They misunderstood what it was he came to do. The disciples even still misunderstood what he came to do. 
even though Jesus would explain to them time and time again. And we think about that, that wonderful moment where Jesus is with his disciples and he asks them, who do people say that I am? Well, people say you're John the Baptist. Elijah, back from the dead. Others say one of the prophets of old. But who do you think I am? And Peter steps up to the plate and says, you are the Christ. To which Jesus is just like, bingo, you got it. That the Father in heaven through his spirit revealed this to you of who I truly am. And then he explains what that means. We all, we all should know this moment. We've talked about this moment many times where you get it, Peter. And this is what that means. That the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests, scribes, and Pharisees and will be crucified. I will be sentenced to death. And Peter's like, no, no, that ain't going to happen. I'm not going to allow that to happen on my watch. It actually says in Mark that Jesus is taken aside by Peter, and Peter begins to rebuke Jesus. Who wants to do that, to rebuke Jesus? Well, let's just say Jesus doesn't take much time to correct Peter and put Peter right back where he needs to be. And he tells Peter something very particular in Mark 8.33. He tells him, Turning to the disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Bringing us to a very important thing that we need to grasp today, as it is Palm Sunday, and how we know it's so easy to get swept away in the celebration, swept away in all the joyous shouts of praise, to say, Hosanna, but to not even really know what it means. Sure, we know it means save us, but save us from what? Because we too can get pulled into this trap just like Peter, where our hearts, our minds, our souls are still just seeing the things of this earth, dealing with the things that are temporary here today and gone the next, begging for salvation from these issues, and forgetting about the weightier issue that we truly need salvation from. The salvation of our very soul. We all, like the disciples, can struggle with this. We all, like the disciples, can fail to recognize what it is even God's word. The prophets of old spoke about this coming king, this coming messiah. These prophets that the disciples would have known good and well as they would have studied these ancient texts in synagogue each and every week as children and as young men and as adults. Passages like Isaiah 53. And we have to read this in full here because it really speaks into this reality of what it was Jesus was coming to do. It is a prophecy about the real work, the real salvation that Jesus was bringing and it says, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men and men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for, his, as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off 
out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? It's because it is. This is what he came to do. And he does it willingly. He does it willingly, knowing good and well when he walked into Jerusalem that day, he wasn't going to be walking out. That the day was coming where the same crowds who were shouting, Hosanna, save us, would also be swept away in another crowd shouting, crucify, crucify him, in such a way that they would actually beg for the release of a known murderer and insurrectionist by the name of Barabbas instead of Jesus. They would choose the murderer over Jesus. And we too do the same, as we too can be easily swept away Focusing on the here and now and not looking at the forest, but stuck on the tree. As that one classic expression goes, you're missing the forest for the trees. So today, when we shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, when we shout, save us, Lord, we beseech you, we plead with you, save us. May we shout it for the right reason. May we shout it asking for salvation for the right thing, for the thing he came to save us from, and that's ourselves. And I know even though I myself, a wretched sinner, I get this wrong time and time again, so focused on the things of man and not focused on the things of God, I thank the Lord for Jesus Christ, who willingly still came into Jerusalem that day heard all those praises, knowing that they were, they were misdirected, misguided, misinformed, because Jesus came to do the unexpected. He came to do God's will here on earth as it is in heaven, regardless of what that meant, regardless of what it meant, bringing us right here to a point of challenge. The point that God's word is challenging us with here 2,000 years later. Still challenging us, still shaping us, still molding us, teaching us, and showing us the way of Jesus. The challenge is to understand clearly those who walk with Jesus for three years, those who walked with Jesus each and every day, spent each and every waking moment with Jesus for three years, missed the point. Would we be so arrogant to think we wouldn't? All the more reason for us to daily check our hearts. When we plead out Hosanna, to really ask, are we pleading out for the right kind of salvation? Are we shouting Hosanna and just going along with the crowd? Or are we shouting Hosanna knowing what it is Jesus truly came to do? and what it is he is going to come again to do. Because he ain't finished yet. And Jesus is coming again. Are we shouting Hosanna for the right reason? Or 
are we going to miss it? Just like the crowd, just like the disciples then. May we set our thing, our minds on the things of God and not the things of man. May we take his word today and the example that each of the gospels proclaim to us and realize it's so easy to get swept away. May we shout Hosanna for the right reasons, for the right salvation. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever.